Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lampos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Today, we're continuing our Bible study on the book of Hebrews. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 9, learning about the great, wonderful privilege we have as Christians to have access to the Father and to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies at the mercy seat of God to receive grace and help in a time of need. So we're going to begin with a little presentation on the book of Hebrews. I always like to do this. I like to uh, play these animated presentations that cover everything that we'll be covering in general. So here's an animated overview of the book of Hebrews before we get into chapter 8 and 9. Hi, Judy. Good to see you. Okay, so here we go. The Letter to the Hebrews. The author of this letter is anonymous, and people have wondered for a long time whether Paul wrote it or maybe one of his co-workers like Barnabas or Apollos, but really we just don't know. In chapter 2 we discover that the author had a first-hand relationship with the disciples who were themselves around Jesus, so we know that this letter is anchored in the teaching of the apostles. We also don't know who the audience of this letter was or even where they lived. The author knows them really well, and he assumes that they have a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, especially the storyline of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, about how Abraham's family became the nation of Israel, about how Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt to Mount Sinai, where they received the Torah, and they made a covenant with God, where they built the tabernacle, where the priests offered sacrifices, and also about how they wandered through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. The author just expects that the readers know all of the details about these stories, and so most likely the audience is made up of Jewish Christians that's where the name of the letter comes from. We also have clues from chapter 10 that this church community was facing persecution and even imprisonment because of their association with Jesus. Some in the community were walking away from Jesus and abandoning the faith altogether. And this explains the purpose and the structure of this letter. First, there's a short introduction, which is followed by four sections where the author compares and contrasts Jesus with key people and events from Israel's history. Jesus is first compared with angels in the Torah, second with Moses and the Promised Land, third with priests and Melchizedek, and lastly with the sacrifices and the covenant. And the author has two main goals in all of these contrasts. The first goal is to elevate Jesus as superior to anyone or anything else, showing that Jesus is worthy of all their trust and devotion. But his second goal is this, it's to challenge the readers to remain faithful to Jesus despite persecution. So in every section he includes a strong warning not to abandon Jesus. Jesus. So let's dive in now and see how this all unfolds. The elevation of Jesus begins in the opening sentence of the introduction. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors in many different ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son. So the author saying that Jesus is superior to all of the previous ways that God has revealed himself to Israel. He then makes this astounding claim that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's nature. These metaphors are making the closest possible identification between Jesus and God. So Jesus is what the rays of light are to the sun, or Jesus is what the wax impression is to the signet ring. For this author, there is no God apart from Jesus. Jesus is God become human as the Son. And it's this mm. elevated view of Jesus that's then explored throughout the rest of the letter. In the first section, the author compares Jesus with angels, which might strike you as kind of odd, like why angels? In Jewish tradition, it was taught, based on Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, that the Torah and the words of God were delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai by angels. And so by saying that Jesus is superior to angels, the author is claiming that Jesus and his message of good news are superior to all previous messengers of God's word. And so the first warning flows from this very point. If Israel was called to pay attention to the Torah that was delivered by angels, how much more should we pay attention to the message that was announced by the Son of God? And not only that, given Jesus' status high above the angels, how remarkable is it that he gave up that high status to become human, to suffer, and to die? In Jesus, we see God's greatest glory and God's great humility as Jesus sympathetically joined himself to humanity's tragic fate. In chapters 3 and 4, the author moves on to argue that Jesus is superior to Moses, who led the people of Israel through the wilderness and built the tabernacle. 
Jesus is also the leader of God's people, but in him we see not the builder of just a tent, but of all creation. Then the author retells the story of how the Israelites rebelled against Moses in the wilderness, and they lost their chance to enter into the rest that God offered them in the promised land. And so here comes the second warning. If Jesus is greater than Moses, how much higher are the stakes if we rebel against him? We also are in a wilderness-like environment where we have to trust God for the future rest in God's new creation. So let's make sure that we don't rebel like Israel did in the wilderness and lose out on God's gracious offer to enter his new creation. In chapters 5 through 7, the author then compares Jesus with Israel's priests that come from the line of Aaron. Their role was to represent Israel before God and to offer sacrifices that atoned for or covered over the sins of the people. But, he points out, the priests were themselves morally flawed people, and so they constantly had to offer sacrifices for their own sins as well as for everybody else's. Something more was needed. <clears throat> and so he then argues that Jesus was that something more. He's the ultimate priest. But Jesus did not come from the line of Aaron. Rather, Jesus was a priest in the order of Melchizedek that mysterious priest king from ancient Jerusalem, and he appears in the stories about Abraham. We also find in Psalm 110 that the messianic king from the line of David will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So the author's whole point is this. Jesus is the ultimate priest king. He's morally flawless. He's eternally available for his people. And so he's superior to any other mediator between God and humans. And thus comes his warning in this section. To reject Jesus is to reject one's best and only chance to be fully reconciled to God. So don't do that which transitions us into the last comparison in chapters 8 through 10. The author shows how Jesus' death on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice superior to all the animal sacrifices offered in the temple. Those sacrifices had to be offered constantly, both daily but also yearly on the Day of Atonement. Jesus offered his life once and for all, and it was sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. And so the author warns the audience from walking away from Jesus. It's like turning your back on a gracious offer of God's forgiveness. Why would you do that? Jesus' sacrifice is permanent, he says, and it's the foundation for the new covenant spoken of in the prophets, where all sins are forgiven. So now that the author has elevated Jesus through all of these contrasts, this final section is one big challenge to follow Jesus. So think big picture. In Jesus, they have found God's very word. In Jesus, they have hope for the new creation. Jesus is their eternal priest. He's the perfect sacrifice. And so now, they should follow all the great models of faith found throughout the story of the scriptures, and they should remain faithful to Jesus, trusting that despite whatever hardship and persecution, God will not abandon his people. That's the basic flow of thought throughout the letter, which the author calls right here at the very end a brief word of exhortation. Here's a couple of extra tips for reading this letter. Whenever the author quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, which is like every other sentence, stop and go look up the reference and read that quotation in its original context. And sometimes you'll be puzzled, but more often you'll see all kinds of extra cool connections that you would never notice otherwise. It's totally worth the effort. You should also just know that these warning passages, they're going to make you uncomfortable, and that's kind of the point. They're not there to make you afraid. They're there to show you that rejecting Jesus is foolish because he's so awesome. These warnings all serve the larger purpose of the letter, to show that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God's love and mercy. And that's what the letter of the Hebrews is all about. Well, that summarizes it very nicely. And now we're going to go to chapter 8 and then chapter 9. Chapter 8 begins with verses 1 and 2, and it summarizes the book of Hebrews just perfectly. Here's what it says. Now, this is the main point of the things that we are saying. Now, this talks about the entire book of Hebrews, that we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, that makes him equal with God, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. We have to remember that Hebrews was not written to Gentiles. Hebrews was written to Jews who had just recently converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a tremendous concern amongst these Jews because they weren't sure if their faith in Jesus was enough to usher them into God's favor and consequently into the eternal kingdom of God. 
So they were very concerned and they wanted to know if Jesus was the real thing or what, or whether he was, or maybe he wasn't the real thing. So because their newfound faith required no sacrifices, no observance of the law of Moses, no temple, no artifacts of the temple to be observed or ministered before, no priesthood to offer the sacrifices on their behalf, that made them a little bit uh, nervous because for the last 2,000 years, excuse me, let this person in, for the last 2,000 years, they were uh, participating in temple realist, uh, ritualistic ceremonial worship of the living God. And now all of a sudden, after all these sacrifices, all these observances of the law, all of these artifacts of the temple being erected, all of these uh, um, warnings from the Lord, the priesthood, all of these things that were really overbearing and impossible to keep, they were now told that it was not necessary anymore because everything had been fulfilled by the life, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Hebrews makes the point immediately in verse 1 of chapter 8 that they had a compassionate high priest who was personally invested in them, who knew them by name, and ministered to them before the Father in the actual temple of the Lord, which is in the kingdom of God, which is completely different from the Levitical priesthood, which was pretty impersonal and distant, because there were three and a half million people in Israel and only a handful of priests, and there was no possible way that the priests could be personally invested in each of these people. So it's pretty impersonal, pretty real, uh, ritualistic, and pretty remote. Now, there were three important points made in the very beginning in that, in verses one and two. First of all, it, it says that Jesus is a high priest who is seated to the right hand of the throne of majesties in the heaven. That means that he's not only a priest, but he's God himself representing them to the most high of which he himself, Jesus, is a member as second person of the Trinity. So this is not just a man we're talking about as high priest. This is God himself. Second point that's important was mentioned in this particular portion of the verse. He's a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord had erected and not man. So his ministry, Jesus's ministry, was foreshadowed, foreshadowed by what the Israelite believers knew, what they were familiar with, which may have been commissioned by God, but was built by the hands of men. So even this system commissioned by God had failed because of the weakness of men. We find out that Jesus is a minister of the true actual sanctuary of God in the heavenlies, which makes his ministry greater than the sanctuary of earth, which is the temple of Solomon, the tabernacle of Moses, etc., etc. Now, this would mean absolutely nothing to Gentiles. But if Gentiles were observant, they would realize that through Jesus Christ, we have been included in the covenant of God and are co-recipients of salvation and citizens of the kingdom of God. And that is spoken of in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. So this is for us Gentiles. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that is the Jews, made in the flesh by hand, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, that is Jews and Gentiles, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the, the problem between us and God, that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him, we have we have we we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So through the cross, God put to death the requirements of the law, laid the law aside and brought us into his kingdom through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 19 to 22. Now, therefore, this is to us again, Gentiles. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. What a privilege. Having been built on the foundation of the apostle and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, <clears throat> in whom the whole building being fitted together 
grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And that's written to Gentiles, which is very important because, you know, the Lord could have died only for the sins of Israel, but he chose in his mercy and grace to include all of us Gentiles into the family of God. And that's very important to know. And thank God that he decided to do that because he was not obligated to die for anybody, not even obligated to die for Israel. But because Israel were the chosen people, he went to them first, and then he came to us, to the Jew first, and then to the Greeks, who represent all the Gentiles. Now, Hebrews aims to confirm this point, that Jesus is a better covenant than Moses, but is at the same time a complete and effective fulfillment of the law and sacrificial system of, the Levitic, of Leviticus. And it was important for the Jews to know that, that Jesus was the fulfillment of everything that they knew, because that was their point of contention. Was Jesus enough? Verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 8, For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, Jesus, also would have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. That is Jesus, inasmuch as he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So Jesus is the high priest from heaven, not from earth. He's not from the order of Levi. He's from the order of Melchizedek, an endless, perfect, everlasting priesthood. Now, every priest, it says, has something to offer of those he represents before the Lord to secure favor and forgiveness of sins on our behalf. Jesus, as a priest, was no different. He had also, he also was required to have something to offer. So my first question is, what was it that Jesus offered on our behalf, Caroline? He offered himself. That's right. He offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Very good. And I think I have another question after that. Um, Jesus offers himself as priest, prophet, and sacrifice because the law of Moses was insufficient. Justin, why was the law of Moses insufficient? There's a main reason. Why. Justin. Uh, it didn't, uh, didn't fulfill uh, uh, the promises that were in the Bible. Okay, didn't fulfill the promises in the Bible. Vivian, why was the law uh, insufficient? What was the reason why it was insufficient? It did not clean our sins away for forever. Okay, and Oliver, why did the law not cleanse us of our sins? What was the main reason why it didn't cleanse us of our sins? Well, the law is just a reflection of uh, it just, uh, it's just a measuring stick just showing all as how sinful we are. Okay, that's a good reason. And Vivi, um, Valerie, rather, why do you think the law was not enough to cleanse us from our sins? Why did it fail? Because it was just laws after laws, and human was not able to do them anyhow. There were too many. That's them. right, because man was weak, and we were not able to keep the law. Therefore, the old covenant was insufficient, not because of God, because he's perfect, but because of our imperfection, the law was not sufficient to save us from our sins. And so that point is made in verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. Why did they not continue? Because they were sinners and there was no way that the laws of Moses would cleanse them from their sin. It was impossible. Not even all the sacrifices that they offered, even at the instructions of the Lord himself. And I disregarded them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, that's a hint of what God is going to do under the new covenant. None of them shall teach their neighbor and none his brothers, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins, and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. So tell me, someone, 
How are the laws of God written in the life and the hearts of the of a believer? Jeffrey, how are the laws of God written in the heart of a believer? Um uh -huh. Good one. I would say um, because we, we read the Bible and live and live the word of God, it's written in our hearts because we because we live His word, the living word. Okay, so how are the law? How's the written word written in our heart, though? You're right about that. It is written in our hearts, but how is it written in our hearts? What is it about the new covenant that writes the laws of God in our hearts? Judy, you want to try to answer that one? Go turn on your microphone. The Holy Spirit. That's it. So tell me how the Holy Spirit writes the laws of God in our heart. What does he do? Well, as we... Still me? Yeah, yeah, it's still you. Uh, well, as we read the word, the Holy Spirit... Um, uh, makes it real to us. And right. through Good faith so right. in what Jesus did. Yep. And the hope that we have. Yep. And the assurance that we have. Uh, it sort of all ties together. It sure does. Thank you, Judy. That's a good answer. And Oliver, what does the Holy Spirit give us that makes us receptive to the laws of God and to the word that Judy was talking about? What does the Holy Spirit do? He changes something in us. What does he change? Changes our hearts. That's right. He changes our heart and he changes our nature. And so now, therefore, we are obedient and we're open to the Lord rather than hostile. And we're able to keep his commandments. Okay, good answers on both of your parts. How is it that every believer will know him? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. He was talking about the law. Because the law and the sacrificial system of Leviticus did not bring true forgiveness. It did not bring the people close to God. It did not remove the power of sin in their hearts. But it offered only ceremonial forgiveness. And that only for one year. And the reason it failed is because it depended on the faithfulness of the people to observe it. And the people of Israel, if you will read throughout the entire Old Testament, were not faithful at all. The new covenant, the better covenant, depends on the faithfulness, righteousness, and perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that brings true forgiveness because it brings actual intimacy with God as it destroys the power of sin inside of us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So that is a better covenant indeed. Now, how did it connect with the old system of worship that was established in the old covenant? The answer comes in chapter nine. So here we go. Now then, indeed, the first covenant had ordinances, the divine service and the earthly sanctuary, which represented the heavenly one. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of, cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we can now speak in detail. But we are going to speak about them in detail. Everything in the old covenant temple or the tabernacle, pointed to Jesus and what he would accomplish for believers. So let's take a look at each of the things. As you walked into the temple or into the tabernacle, whichever the case may be, you would run into this, the brazen altar. The brazen altar is where the priests offered sacrifices for sin, sacrifices for, fe for peace, thanksgiving sacrifices were all laid on the brazen altar. And that pointed to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ when he would lay down his life and by his blood shed forgive us of all our sins right after the blonde, the bronze altar was the uh, laver which had water on the top and water on the bottom the priests have offering these uh, animals to the lord were full of blood and they washed off the blood from their hands up here and they washed off the blood off their feet from down here now this points to the holy spirit and his sanctifying work taking what jesus did on the cross and applying it to our lives and as the blood of jesus is applied into our lives through the operation of the Holy Spirit, we are cleansed from sin and the power of sin is destroyed in our hearts. So that's represented sanctification by the labor. Once you got into the tabernacle, you ran into the, whole, the uh, golden candlestick. It had seven branches, one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven. Six branches represented us because six is the number of man. And the seventh candlestick, the one in the bottom, or the one in the middle, rather, the main candlestick that held all the others together, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day the priest would light these candles, make sure they were always burning, and that represented the Holy Spirit's ministry in our hearts, who enlightens us and helps us to understand the word and apply and obey it, and also empowers us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be able to live for God and preach the gospel. From there, on the other side of the tabernacle was the table of the showbread, which had six loaves on one side, six loaves on the other side, each one representing a tribe of Israel. But what it actually represented was that Jesus is the bread of life. So once you are saved, once you are sanctified in the spirit, once you are filled with the spirit, you're now able to draw on the power of Jesus and the wisdom of Jesus for every matter of life and every matter of godliness. And that's what feeding on Jesus is all about. From there, in front of the veil, which hid the Ark of the Covenant from the people, from the priest rather, was the altar of the incense. And the incense that was burned on the altar had to be according to an exact formula, because this represented the perfect life of Jesus as an offering for sin to his father. And the smoke that rose from the altar represents worship and obedience, which is what happens when we are saved, sanctified, filled with the spirit, feeding on Jesus, we're able to worship him and, and obey him in spirit and in truth. And then, of course, there's the Ark of the Covenant, which represents intimacy with God experientially and positionally. When we are first saved, we positionally have access to the throne of God. But it's something that we have to learn to appreciate and learn to exploit. And we do that as we learn, as we get saved and we are sanctified, as we learn and we develop in the things of God. Our intimacy, our intimacy with the Lord goes beyond just positional intimacy, but into experiential intimacy. And we are able to be face to face with the Father in reality. When these things had been prepared, the priests, this is Hebrews continuing now, always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed it in ignorance, the Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So intimacy with God was not possible under the old law. It was not possible under the old covenant. And in fact, the tabernacle and the temple demonstrated to the people of God that there was no way that they could approach him. Because rather than being inviting and rather than being an open door to the presence of God, the tabernacle was actually a closed door. Every part of the tabernacle issued the message, keep out, keep your distance, keep away. And that was definitely signified in Mount Sinai when the Lord gave Moses the commandments and told people not to come near the mountain lest they be destroyed. So in spite of the fact that God himself had instituted the old covenant worship, it did not bring intimacy with God. And that is established here in verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all, which is access to the Father, was not made manifest while this first tabernacle or temple was still standing. So even though the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year to offer the blood sacrifice of animals, it was not enough to bring forgiveness because he himself was a sinner. So <laughs> the old covenant was performed by people who were in sin and could not possibly have their sins removed by trying to reach God through keeping the law and observing the sacrifices. And this is confirmed in verse 9. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the services perfect in regard to the conscience. No, there's nothing in the law, nothing in the Levitical sacrifices that can, that can help a man be free of his sins and walk for God, or walk with God. Concerning only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed until the time of the Reformation. Now, here's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant under the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. But Christ came as a high priest, of good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation so jesus ministers on our behalf in the true tabernacle of the father which is in the kingdom of heaven not with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all having obtained eternal redemption so the blood of jesus guarantees 
total forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future. Somebody asked me, you know, how does how does Jesus deal with the sins we commit after we become a Christian? Well, the answer is, is that when Jesus died on the cross, he established a reservoir of, forgive, of forgiveness that we could draw from at any time. So even when we sin, our sins are already forgiven, but we must confess our sins and experience what Jesus has already provided for us through the cross and through the shed blood. So that's why it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because he's already entered the holy place with his own blood and offered it once and for all for our eternal redemption. So we have forgiveness at all times when we fall. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh for one year just one year because it had to be repeated over and over again every year and it was just ceremonial how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living god and this states why jesus's blood is totally effective in forgiving our sins and so for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. I found that a little confusing and hard to understand. So I went to the NLT, the New Living Translation, and here's the same verse in the NLT so we can all understand it. This is why he, Jesus, is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and the people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins that they had committed under the first covenant. So why was it necessary for Jesus to die? I've been asked this question by many people. Here's the answer. For, there were, for where there is a testament, that is a covenant, there must also be of necessity the death of the testator. In other words, every covenant has somebody who initiated the covenant. In order for the covenant to be absolved, the one who initiated the covenant must die. Isn't that interesting? For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the tabernacle of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Now that's a long, complicated passage, but it's very easy to understand once you summarize it. In short, here's what it says. Someone has to die to pay for sin and furthermore shed his blood, which is the life of the body. Under the old covenant, it was animals. I, well, this is supposed to say bulls, not buses. <laughs> it's bulls. Okay, let me fix that. There we go. Bulls, goats, sheep, and pigeons. But under the new covenant, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who lays down his life and spills his blood. This is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read each of the God's commandments to all the people, this is from the NLT, he took the blood of calves and goats along with the water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. And then he said, this is the blood that confirms the covenant that is made that God has made with you. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So what does it mean? It means that the Old Testament rituals were always done with spilt blood and all the artifacts of the temple, the brazen altar, the laver, the candlestick, the table of the showbread, the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of the incense, because they all pointed to the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which would be shed in the future for the forgiveness of sins and makes it possible for us to enter the true tabernacle of God 
and experiencing and experience all the things that the artifacts represented had to be spilled with blood, had to be sprinkled with blood, because none of this is available to us apart from the blood of Jesus. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for all of us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So the blood of Jesus is, was so powerful, it only had to be offered once, just once. And we need to remember that it is appointed for men to die once, but after this is the judgment. And so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And here's a great artist's depiction of what we just read. The blood of the <laughs> Jesus Christ forgives us of all sin. And that, my friends, is the Bible study for this week. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bless you. Bye-bye.